Thanks for being here, Chris. Thanks for inviting me. So maybe we could just start off, uh, if you could just introduce yourself to the, to the audience and let us know a little bit about how you got involved in farming. Right. Um, I was actually born and bred in a little wee place called Tirao in the middle of the Waikato. Um, I used to think that Auckland was the northernmost suburb of it, um, but it's a population of about 800 people. Um, I left school and went down to Christchurch, um, where I did an aircraft engineering apprenticeship. So I became a qualified aircraft maintenance engineer. I had 15 years doing that. And the, the land always kept on taking on us. So I ended up um, buying a farm. To, it was just coming out of the the soft prices that land had gone through after Rogenomics, which was a major change in the New Zealand economy. So we bought just on 360 hectares of land and it had irrigation with it and we thought, oh, this is neat. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so we got involved with what irrigation was, which was border diking, it was water flowing down the paddocks between levees. And New Zealand had just come to a new act of parliament, which was the Resource Management Act, the new... Um, I think it got rid of about 60 odd acts of parliament and put out uh, resource sustainable planning altogether. Our resource consents came up as the first lot that Environment Canterbury, who were just newly formed out of catchment boards. So it was really going into the unknown. Mm. So I got a little bit involved in water politics from that and then sort of moved through farming, then living beside, right beside a small river. So there was a community river liaison group and that's where there's a rating district and community voices on how you do protect all the what's going on in the riverbed with the flood protection works. And then sort of moved through the school board of trustees and finally got into um, a bit of government politics uh, through farming. So that was into the local branch of Federated Farmers and there's 26 branches up and down the country and wrong place, right time sort of thing, or right place, wrong time. Um, provincial president's job came around as just a consequence. So I thought I would grab that and ran with that. And at the same time, we had some naughty councillors who got sacked by the government for not putting a plan in place. So all that was happening as I was provincial president. So the environmental spa space came right to the forefront. So I was looking after that from our um, Ferro Farmers mid-Canterbury perspective. But I was also looking after North Canterbury, South Canterbury and some of that stuff because there's another leadership layer that we have within Federated Farmers. And then at the right time it sort of came about, we were, had a zone committee that was in the Ashburton area. So I've now got myself actually, I'm on the zone committee as a community me member. Some think I'm there because I'm federated farmers. I'm not, I'm there as a community member to represent the interests of our community. Just so coincidental, I'm from federated farmers. But of that, there's 10 targets that we're trying to look at. You know, there's, there's cultural targets, there's biodiversity targets, there's water quality, water quantity a whole range, all trying to be done simultaneously, a really hard discussion. And then the job um, came up where unfederated farmers nationally, um, we ended up um, in a position where there was an at-large position. We don't represent, there's two of us don't represent an industry group, so there's a dairy section, there's a meat and fibre, there's a cropping section, or it could be bees or whatever, um, so I'm at-large. And coming through with a bit of an environmental background, I've picked up the environmental space but that doesn't include climate change as my portfolio. We've got water, quality, quantity, biodiversity, all that side of things are in my space. So over the last 12 months through the Land and Water Forum, I've spent a lot of time in that wonderful city um, called Wellington. So, and some, the government are just announcing tomorrow some of the initiatives that have, in the time I've been on the Land and Water Forum, will hopefully be coming into policy with some caution, hopefully. So that's where I've come from as my journey and how I sort of got involved with water and from a farming perspective. So is it fair to characterise Federated Farmers as sort of an industry trade group that represents farmers from throughout New Zealand? It's a, yeah, a completely voluntary organisation. There is no levies on anyone, but there's a voluntary membership. And that, off that membership, we supply all our advocacy people. There's 70 policy advisors from one end of the country. They're out in the provinces, there's a few that are in Wellington, but generally we're a, a provinces-based, grassroots-up type organisation. We're not just about lobbying government or district councils or regional councils. We're actually a really good sounding place. Um, a problem is actually halved when you talk about it. 
when you go along to your federated farmers meeting and you've got a problem on your farm, and it might be nothing to do with the environment, it might be nothing else, you can actually talk something through, and that there's a great um, voice of that. Where we have droughts or there's adverse events, it's a network of people coming together, like-minded, trying to um, come up with solutions. And, and you mentioned water as an area that, that you've focused, and obviously water and farming are two sides of the same coin and, and interlinked so deeply. Uh, could you, you know, and, and there's been um, some challenges that we've faced uh, with water quality uh, throughout New Zealand, especially in the rivers and algal blooms and the like. Um, could you comment on some of the initiatives that are happening uh, around water quality and things that, are, things that are going forward to help address that issue? One of the things we're working on at a national level, and it's been all farmers should be operating at good management practice. So what is good management practice? Well, Canterbury, through water quality, they decided they wanted to go down this good management practice pro approach. So they got the industry groups where you do pay levies, and they set a level for what is a good management practice at, at what your peers would reasonably expect you to be able to do. So if farmers are already doing it, it's not like it's a, a policy boffin who's come up with an idea and said you should be doing this. And to get everyone on that even playing field. But I started... We started farming 20 odd years ago where we were doing certain practices. Those same practices now, as new techniques come forward, are so old school. Some people are still doing them. Most people are thinking for economic reasons, I'm now doing the right things. But a good management practice is something really simple like um, that you've got a crop that you're growing. You want to grow a certain yield. What's the soil test telling you where you're at? What's the yield you want to do? How much fertiliser do I need to put on? Not that my granddad used to put on 300 weight and I'm just going to carry on that sort of technique. So some of these good management practices um, are something that we, we're trying to get national policy and that's put through the Land and Water Forum to get it that all farmers are on the same field. But we need to have good, good entrepreneurialship of those out front who are actually really pushing the bounds. Ten years ago, if someone told me I would be putting moisture meters in the ground to work out when I should be scheduling my irrigation, I would have said, they're bonkers. Why would you be doing that? I could go out there, put a spade in the ground, feel the dirt and say, it needs some water. Or, no, it's fine. Now we can look at two lines on a graph where we've got moisture probes and say, well, if we irrigate now, we're going to go to full, full capacity in the soil. When it rains, we're going to end up with a bigger drainage event. But if I keep it in this band here... I can save water, I can save energy, and I can save quite a bit of time and maintenance. So all those things are positives for me, but it took someone out 10 years ago, which was actually a, a farm environment winner, who was really passionate about it, to be really pushing that stuff, so that now I'm mainstream and I'm picking it up. But I'm a little bit ahead of the mainstream, there's a lot of people who aren't yet. But we've, I've had to convince my wife that it's a good idea, it's not cheap, but at least I can actually look at my phone now and see, should I be irrigating or not? Cool. So you mentioned the, the desire to create some national policy around these best practices. Uh, does that mean, as of now, that there is no direct regulatory body which enforces these kind of best practices at a national level? The good management practices were established last year. That sort of work's done. It's how do you review them? How do you ensure that everyone does them? That there's the discussion that's going on with the Ministry for the Environment and Ministry for Primary Industries, trying to work out how do you put that into a, a regulation framework. Most things are, are common sense. That's a good comms strategy of how you actually encourage people to do it rather than a stick behind. Um, so we've just got to convince the benefits of doing it because we've got water quality issues we need to manage and lower our environmental footprint. So if, if the decisions are being driven uh, largely from an economic basis uh, for some of these practices, what, what benefits do you think might entice farmers to... You know, so for example, we, we just purchased this dairy farm right here, and um, I would say it wasn't being operated to the fullest best practices in previous ownership where uh, the river ways weren't planted, the, the cows would just walk right through the river, uh, putting their effluent and their waste directly into the waterway, uh, which is, as my understanding, not sort of best practice where you would normally have them fenced. Um, the reason why that was done was simply economics. Um, so what, what can we do as, as New Zealand to, to create more buy-in from farmers who, who admittedly often just don't have the money 
to, to put in the fencing, to, to do all the planting, to, uh, to take all these action steps which require time, capital, education, and, and effort. The, the one thing I think we get a bit fo too focused on the sides of the rivers and whatever, we've got farmers who have come through a whole lifetime. They've been to university, they've learned how to do their farming, but farming systems, knowledge of the environmental impacts is growing and being learnt. And like you guys are pushing the frontiers, we've got to actually bring those guys along so that we're all heading in that same direction. We hear that all the time we should actually have our waterways fenced and planted. Mm. If it's done the wrong way, you actually make a bigger mess than you started with. And I'll, it's probably a bit provocative, but an example is you fence it and you put a nice tall shelter belt right beside it. The stock used to go down and have a drink and then they used to walk out on the land and into the hills. Now you've given them the shelter right beside the waterway. Mm. When it rains, all the nutrients that were sitting on the ground there have now flushed straight into it rather than come all the overland path down the waterway. So we've got to be really careful how we manage our footprint mm. but encouraging good practices and so doing that we've got to make sure that we invest the time, the mm. effort to understand what's going on. Yeah. And make sure the actions that we take actually get the results that we're looking for and don't have these unintended side we effects. We are looking at water quality, we're not just looking at stock exclusion for the right. sake of it, we right. just want to make sure we make a difference to what is the end game mm. and it's good water quality. And how do, how do we measure that as a, as a nation and as an industry? Like measure, how, do we, how do we know if we're making progress on water quality? There's the usual way which we can actually go out there and take a water sample. Um, I think one of the, we've, the one thing I really believe in is the having good, consistent reporting from our district and regional councils. Mm. So the first thing I say is, why haven't we got national swimming quality data? Mm. Well, I think for the Ministry of Environment, haven't been able to actually get it consistently from the regional councils so they can report it nationally. Because some do it this way and some do it that way. So we're encouraging the Ministry for the Environment to go to the regional councils and district councils and get it standardised so you can report, is that swimming hole where I used to swim always up to swimming standard? So we've got to make sure that we've got good data. And Environment Aotearoa is a report that was put out last year. Mm. A massive amount of work. We're a little bit critical on one or two things. They had some shortcomings. But it's a really good document to actually have a good basis for that. So we've got, we've got to look at that. We've got some really good introduced species of... Um, uh, algae that uh, Didymo is a classic one. We've got to make sure that the stuff doesn't come to the North Island. It's mm. in the South Island and it really thrives where the water's cleanest and that there's getting right up into the mountain um, rivers as well. Mm. So um, biosecurity mm. across the strait here, make sure you don't get, end up with here because look after what have you got. Mm. As a side note, if you uh, get a chance to jump off the, the big uh, high dive in Wellington Harbor, I highly recommend it. <laughs> the water is clearly safe. Um, this provides, a, I think, a good, good opportunity to segue to talk about innovation in farming. Um, you know, we've, uh, there's a lot of people here who, who work in uh, high-tech industries and the like, and, and I think one thing that I've seen in my time living in New Zealand is uh, that there's quite a bit of opportunity uh, to bring new ideas and new technologies into the agricultural industry. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, recent trends in, in agricultural innovation and where you see uh, things going into the future. I've got a son who went through Lincoln. He did a year there. More, He's keen, keen on um, doing IT type stuff and gizmos and electronics. So he, but he's also brought up on a farm and he understands farming, but he also understands code and apps and that sort of thing. And to me, the innovation that we're starting to see, the short-term gain at the moment, is actually using that data effectively. And just a few years ago, we had national regulation that said that we needed to have, for our irrigation takes, needed to be metered. Well, there was a bit of a thing went up in the air and everyone said, oh, God, what's this going to cost us? And then there was talk about it had to be telemetered. Back then, no one know, knew what telemetry was and how it was going to work or whatever. Um, we've put a gate, an irrigation gate in it cost about $30,000. You know, we could have bought a new car and whatever. But this gate, now I can operate it from my cell phone. In actual fact, I got a text from my wife this morning said, can you just alter the irrigation gate? So I can do that easier from Wellington or I could do it easier from California last year than I could actually from home. It used to take five minutes to log on to the computer and whatever because we needed internet. 
But all those sort of things start adding up. And then when you use telemetry at the same time as we're using it with water moisture probes, but putting the information in a format that we can all understand, and we can start making some really informed decisions. At the moment, we're using patch-up type, um, making systems that they were never really designed for to do a job that we need to. But we also need that other real good science -y innovation. And it, is it the drought-tolerant grasses? Do, do we mention genetic modification? Do we, uh, do we not mention genetic modification? Do we wait for things to evolve a, a lot? But what we're, we're finding on our farm is there's a lot of natural selection that's actually been improving, and we can make some really good uh, productivity gains that a few years ago we were talking about growing lambs at 200 grams a day on pasture, clover, or whatever. Now with some of the brassicas that we're putting into our crops, you know, we're actually really cranking those things up. But we've just got to make sure that we've got good evolution coming through on all, all the crops that we need. But science, soils. If you really wanted to invest in something, soils. What do we rely on for agriculture? What do we need for nutrients? What do we need for carbon sequesta sequestration? All that stuff. We don't have enough information on what our soils are doing and what the impacts that have, they have because we want to be maintain ourselves as the most efficient producers in the world. So yeah, investment in that sort of technology is where I'd really be encouraging you guys to go. Yeah, cool. Uh, certainly agree in investing in our soils is a, is a good area of focus. So, um, because we did mention it, um, genetic modification uh, is certainly uh, a topic that is uh, in the zeitgeist and, and often quite controversial. So. Of course, we'll tackle it now. Uh, I would like to hear um, from your perspective what uh, what is the state of genetic modification uh, with regards to New Zealand farming, um, whether that be from kind of splicing genes together or just very aggressively uh, breeding for very specific traits, and and what do you see as the trend for for GMOs in New Zealand? One thing I will say that is right outside my field of expertise, okay. the GMO stuff. But I'm actually involved in with the feds through the the uh, biodiversity space, and we all talk about our pests. And to me, that affects every farm, every property in the country. If we could use something that we could get away with some of the poisons, but we could actually naturally stop some of our native, sorry, not native, our, and introduce pests from breeding, whether it be rats, whether it be possums, but I don't think the Australians would like to hear too much about that. But if we could stop these things from actually eating or destroying our native biodiversity, I think there could be an opportunity there to do something the right way. But are we ready for that discussion? Or I don't know what, what stage the technology is at, but do we always have to talk about genetic modification for pasture species or animals or whatever? But we could, can we talk about it for reproductive inefficiency so that these animals don't actually become such a burden to our biodiversity. I think we're, it's something we need to start talking about, but I just thought I'd put, the, put that idea out there. Cool. And just taking the chance to connect the two nodes that uh, last time that Lou from Department of Conservation spoke about how the introduced pests were a huge threat to the ecology and the biodiversity, and now another voice of, of expertise saying that pests are a huge issue for the economy of the country as well. So uh, yet again, the interlinking of these things where our planet and our economy are, are really one and, uh, and, and so interconnected. Um, let me just bring up my questions here. You know, another another question. You know, just bringing it a little bit to to sort of uh, current events. Um, there's been a precipitous decline in the price of dairy uh, over the last you know year. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about you know, given that dairy is is such an important part of the New Zealand farming uh, industry and, and economy. Um, what what do you see this doing to to the farmers that you speak with in in Christchurch and Canterbury uh, and throughout the country? Uh, what what's this going to do to to the industry? There's massive hardship for an individual farmer, the, the farmer whether it be a husband or wife partnership, whatever. That's massive tension. So we've got to keep an eye on that. And the bank the banks a big part of supporting those guys. The, th the byproduct where you'll see it is in rural New Zealand. It's the cities, other oh, townships, um, the schools, whatever. You might, the dairy farm might not be employing another staff member. That staff member might have one children, child or two 
children less come into the local school. It puts school roles under a little bit more pressure. The local business in Ashburton, for example, they mightn't be selling the TV sets, they mightn't be selling the occasional new car. All those things are going to start building up. The essentials will always be bought, the groceries and whatever, but at some of those more discretionary spends will put a massive um, pressure under the rest of the communities. Now, look, for example, in Ashburton, uh, which is halfway down the South Island. It's a township of about 20-odd thousand, or 15,000. Um, new sports centre's gone in. Swimming pool, five courts, whatever. As people's jobs become not as much overtime and whatever, and the rates burden, whatever, the less time to go do a bit more swimming. So all those things start, and it puts more and more pressure on our district council to where do they get their funds from. Well, it won't be coming from the rural community because everyone's got their backs against the wall. So it's... That there's where I see it'll be an insidious pro problem, but then again, it could turn around just like that. But what I'm seeing, I was in California two, 18 months ago, we could see the price of oil was through the, through the shale, fracking, whatever, was, and America becoming more and more sustainable for the oil. We could see more grain was becoming surplus. It was going down the throats of dairy cows and producing. We could st sort of see that picture starting to build up. And then with the Europeans um, now being able to come online with export, it's going to be around for a wee while. Till, and now we've got the um, uh, Saudis and whatever, they haven't got the money to spend on the meat. So that's now actually another consequence that we're having coming through to the meat industry. So everything's all connected, and the New Zealand grain industry. So we're all connected in this one together, but we haven't really got a big up at the moment except for beef, which is going well, and a lot of the horticultural products are going pretty well. Glad the horticultural has been there to, to balance that. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time and your contribution. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure.